Let's talk about some diagnostic procedures. And I really just kind of want to introduce some diagnostic procedures to you. You're not going to be required to know uh, them at any real level of depth. And these, some of these will, procedures will come back um, to, into our conversations again as we get talking about the individual pathologies. So we're going to divide them f into a non-invasive and an invasive group. So in the non-invasive category, we have base, some basic EKG. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Some echo, an echocardiogram, phonocardiogram, chest and a chest X-ray, as well as some um, radionucleotide imaging, and then um, magnetic uh, resonance imaging or MRI. So. In the invasive category, we have cardiac catheterization and we have hemodynamic blood monitoring. So let me talk about these in individually here for a second. So we have EKGs, which is some, or, EK, or ECG. You may ha also know of this as an ECG. Both are the same. Um, this is where we are basically looking at the electrical activity of the heart. So it's a recording of the electrical activity of the heart. And, the, and it's non-invasive. And the kind of information that we can get out of a EKG is we can sort of intuit um, what's going on with the size of the heart based on different ch wave changes. So the P wave is, so traditionally the, the EKG is the P followed by the QRS complex and then the T wave. So if you have an abnormal P wave, the P wave corresponds to what's going on electrically in the atria. So if you have a heightened P wave, that tr traditionally would indicate that you have an enlarged atria. The distance between the P wave and the Q, um, if that enlarges or elongates, <clears throat> excuse me, that indicates that we have a conduction disturbance because it's taking longer for the impulse to get from the p to the from the atria to the ventricles and so that p to q segment if you will um, enlarges or elongates um, if you have an uh, an abnormally large qrs complex that historically is indicative of ventricular hypertrophy and then we have a the potential for an inverted T wave, which can mean um, that we have some ischemic damage to the heart. The T wave is a little bit variable from person to person. So that's not oh, an inverted T wave, or an, and, and sometimes there's t, a, a particular person might have what appears to be an abnorm, abnormal T wave, especially in one of the leads. Um, but that doesn't always mean anything. That could be normal for them. So it's it's that that's a, a little bit of you have to sort of like kind of take take a little bit more inform a little more information to figure out the clinical significance of an inverted T wave, especially if it's in just one of the leads. Um, if we have a heightened T wave, oftentimes that means high blood potassium or hyperkalemia and a depressed or a decreased T wave, not necessarily inverted, just not, not as high, um, historically indicates low blood potassium or hypokalemia. So those are just some ideas. Um, here's a picture, it's a little blurry, of a um, EKG. Um, and I should have had this up before I started talking. So that P wave is t telling us what's going on in terms of depolarization in the atria, followed by an SA node uh, arriving at that threshold. The, again, the time between the P wave and the Q is what we look at for conduction disturbances. If that, if that space gets larger, the QRS complex um, gives us some information about ventricular depolarization. And then the T wave historically is our repolarization wave. So again, like I said, there's the most variation in the T wave presentations from person to person. So this is what a normal EKG looks like. And um, there's some different leads here, right? You can see the different leads are all labeled. But when you look at that, you know, you just kind of eyeball it. 
you can see that in each of those segments, everything kind of looks the same. The distance, the, the height of the waves, the amplitude of the waves, um, whether that's the P wave, the QRS complex, or the T wave, they all look pretty uniform, and that's exactly what you want to see. So that's a perfectly normal EKG. Um, this person has some enlarged P waves. So you can see them in a few different places, but this is the place that it's pretty easy to see. So this, look at this. So this is the QRS complex, and this is the P wave, right? That's the P wave there. That's the P wave there. Those are really big P waves, and that's telling us that this person has um, a most likely an enlarged atria. Here's some strange T wave sort of a situation. So this is what we refer to as an ST elevation. So the QRS complex never came back down and it just sort of went right into this T wave. So that's an ST elevation, which I didn't talk about, but that's another indicator of myocardial infarction, same as if you were to have an inverted T wave. All right, now let's look at chest x-rays for a minute. Chest x-rays are also non-invasive. You're not going to get a whole lot of information out of a chest x-ray, but you can see potentially the size of the chambers, um, the overall size of the heart, and maybe the major vessels. Um, if somebody has a significant, and I'm the emphasis on the word significant here, significant calcification of either valves or coronary arteries, you might pick up some of that. Calcium is radio opaque, and so that will actually show up on the x-ray. It will look, look like a, a brighter white color, if you will. Um, if there's a fluid in the lungs, like in the case of um, a heart failure patient that's actually starting to experience pulmonary edema, you may see the fluid in the lungs there. This is a normal chest x-ray, right? Um, this actually, this, this, this is, look, does look pretty normal. So this is the heart in here. And so when you look at this, there's not a whole lot to see. But if this person had a really enlarged heart, remember um, in our lecture in class, I showed you uh, a picture of a normal heart versus an enlarged heart. And then the enlarged heart takes on kind of like this botchy ball appearance. So this part up here, the upper part of the heart, the ventricle, the atria, part of me, tend to be like a little bit rounder. So this would take on a more bulbous appearance if it was enlarged. That's a perfectly normal chest x-ray. All right. Um, I'm not going to talk about everything on our list. Um, echocardiograms. An echo basically is like a picture and a sound test. I don't think I, for whatever reason, didn't talk about it. But basically what happens is sound waves kind of get thrown. And any and then when they hit t tissues of different densities, that sound is deflected. And so that's the kind of thing that gets, that gets read with an echo. Um, MRIs are pretty useful for a more crisp picture. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on all the, the science behind an MRI and exactly what's happening, but there is this magnetic field that gets generated um, by the spin of certain nuclei, and that's essentially what's creating the picture. Um, you don't have to inject any contrast medium with an MRI, which makes it kind of nice because that can be problematic. So that's why we can still consider this still to be a non-invasive test. So this is kind of what an MRI of the chest looks like. And so they're going to be kind of taken in slices. And um, this is anterior, right? This is the sternum. This is posterior. It's the vertebral body and the spinous process back here. And so these are the lungs. And this is the heart. And so when you see this, you can see in this particular slice, you can see nicely into the chambers. You can see the septum. You can see the walls. Um, you can actually see in here the pericardial space right in there. So you can give a, a, a lot of pretty good information. And then you would continue to move through. So you'd see different sections of the heart with each slice. So that's a nice, um, a very nice image. So like if there was a tumor, a space occupying lesion, um, you know, maybe a, a septal defect where you've got a hole here, that would be something you could easily see with an MRI. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, phonocardiograms, I guess I did have it on here. I didn't think I had it on here. Um, so this is a uh, specific reading of the sound. It's most oftentimes used with an ECG. And then we have um, radionucleotide imaging, which in this case, we're going to use some tracers. So they're going to have to inject something. And the tracer will attach either to the blood or it will attach to the myocardium, and you'll watch the tracer be picked up. So you can watch blood through the, move through the heart, or you can watch the, the motion of the myocardium. 
Um, now into the invasive categories, we have cardiac catheterization and hemodynamic blood monitoring. So cardiac catheterization is pretty interesting. It's a single measurement, means it's done. It's not. It's not. It's not something that they can. You can kind of keep monitoring over time. So you'll insert a cardiac catheter, and it will measure pressures, the amount of pressure, what kind of pressure. It will measure pressure against um, the pressure, pressure, pardon me, in the individual chambers and also across the valves. So that's helpful, especially when somebody's heart is failing. Um, and so the other thing we can do, we see with cardiac catheterization is the um, administration of a dye. And that dye then can measure, be measure, can, can be used, pardon me, to measure cardiac output. It can also measure, we can also measure our oxygen content with cardiac catheters. And then the hemodynamic blood um, monitoring is the same, it, well, similar, but instead it's done over a longer period of time, so at the bedside. And so really what it, we can do nicely with hemodynamic blood monitoring is to measure central venous pressure, which will give us an idea of what's going on with the right side of the heart. Also arterial pressure, which gives us ideas about cardiac output and also peripheral resistance and um, we can measure directly cardiac output um, either from the and we could also do it on the on the right side with pulmonary artery and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure so here's a picture of a cardiac catheter being inserted you can sort of see here and then um, sort of thread it being threaded up all right i'm going to stop this video here because i'm sure you can hear my dog whining in the background so i'm going to going to deal with her and I will come back with the next objective.